Levi's Inn. We're on the USS Constellation. We're in the Inner Harbor in beautiful downtown Baltimore. We're under canvas because it's a little drizzly today, but we're dry, so we're in great shape. We're going to have an interesting show with Paul O'Neill, who is a crew member here, and a docent on the Constellation. He's got a lot of information. He's going to be on in just a moment, so please stay with us. We've got some noise in the background. We'll try and take care of that guy, but please stay with us. We'll be right there. USS Constellation. There's a grand lady in Baltimore who has taken her rightful place as the Inner Harbor's crown jewel in the heart of the Chesapeake Bay. Launched in 1854 as the last all-sail ship designed and built for the United States Navy, Constellation's century of service embraced the ages of sail, steam, gas, diesel, and nuclear power. Imagine that, launched in 1854 and still afloat. Even more exciting, visitors can come aboard Constellation and explore to their heart's content. On board Constellation, history comes alive as visitors touch, feel, and experience what life was like for sailors during the Civil War. Just bring your imagination. Constellation is the second of three U.S. Navy vessels to carry the same venerable name. The first, the Frigate Constellation, was built right here in Baltimore at Harris Creek and launched in 1797. Known as the Yankee Racehorse, the Frigate Constellation was one of the first six ships built by the United States Navy. The ship you see here, the Sloop of War Constellation, was built at the Gosport Navy Yard in Portsmouth, Virginia and launched in 1854. A newspaper account from the day of her launch reported that there were eight pieces of the original frigate constellation contained within her timbers. The third constellation was the aircraft carrier CB-64. Launched in 1960, she served until 2003. President Ronald Reagan called her America's flagship. But it's the Sloop of War constellation that's here in Baltimore today and the Chesapeake Bay has always been central to her story. Throughout her century of service, uh, Constellation served in and out of the Chesapeake Bay. It was kind of like coming home every time she returned to the Chesapeake Bay. She was, she was created here at Gosport Navy Yard. And throughout her career, she came to Annapolis. She spent many years there. She sailed to Philadelphia. She sailed up and down the bay several times. Uh, and uh, every time that she returned, it was like a homecoming for her. Constellation's early career is perhaps her proudest and most exciting. From 1855 to 1858, she sailed the Mediterranean to protect American interest and show the flag. From 1859 to 1861, she served as flagship of the U.S. African Squadron, cruising off the western coast of Africa in pursuit of American slave ships. The most important thing that people learn on this ship that very few had ever heard of was the ship's uh, relationship to the African squadron. That this country did have at sea before the Civil War a fleet of ships designed solely to free slaves who'd been captured and were on their way to the Western Hemisphere. Constellation captured three slave ships, Delicia, Cora, and Triton. Four alone carried a human cargo of 705 captive Africans. While Constellation was flagship, the U.S. African Squadron captured 14 slave ships and freed almost 4,000 Africans destined for slavery in the Americas. During the Civil War, Constellation served once again in the Mediterranean, where she protected U.S. commerce, took part in the blockade against the Confederate raider Sumter, and showed the flag throughout the Mediterranean world. Welcome back, we're on the Constellation. We're competing a little bit with the rain on the tarp in the background, but I'm here with crew member Paul O'Neill, and it looks like that you are appropriately dressed. Can you tell me a little bit about the era from which this, uh, you, would you call it a costume? Is that a problem? Uh, we never call it a costume, oh, sir. I'm, I, my Actors apologies. wear costumes. Very good, all right. All right, and I am dressed somewhere. in the uniform of the United States Navy. I feel like okay. saluting me. All right, Paul. All right, that's okay. Okay. Um, talk to any reenactor, anyone who does a living history interpretation. All right. And you use the word costume, and you will basically get the same response. Okay, we wear reproduction clothing. We wear, our, our shorthand term is garb. Garb. Okay, but uh, in my case, I would never call it garb because it is a uniform. Uh, my uniform is a bit of a mix and match. I am wearing 
a 13 button fly stove pipe right. okay. and this was adopted by the Navy in 1896 with the 13 buttons. The Civil War era pants would have had a 5 button fly or a 7 button fly. My Somehow, I hate to interrupt, but somehow 13 buttons seems more cumbersome than five. Or it seven. is. When the uniform manufacturers figured out they could charge the Navy more money because they are putting more buttons on the uniform, that's when they changed. Things haven't changed, have they? No, they haven't. All right. Um, it goes back to Rome, and Romans took it from the Egyptians. <laughs> the um, 13 button fly is actually a 14 button fly. The old story is, is that it's the 13 buttons for the original 13 columns in the States. All right. And since there are 14 buttons, it doesn't work. Right. Okay. It's right. a bonus button. It's a bonus button. Well, it's hidden by the All right. Very good. People stop counting it. And the, the silk neckerchief right, silk goes back to the early days of sale. Uh, the neckerchief is used to wipe sweat. Sailors back then would have long hair. They would also put tar on the long hair to keep it from blowing around. And so the neck you could be used to the hot car when it starts melting. Just mm -hmm. melt okay. open, won't hit your neck. Right. That is also why the uh, white uniform jumper and the navy blue jumpers have a flap to protect the majority of the uniform from the tip of the car. Very good, very good. All right. And the device that you have through this, your... This is my bosun's pipe. Bosun's pipe, all right. All right, the bosun's pipe is um, an old signal of office. Uh, petty officers in the United States Navy who are working the deck, bosuns. A bosun is a man who is in... A bosun's mate is a man who is in charge of helping the bosun with the rigging and the small boats of the ship. That's the family boat. The original... Pronunciation was boat swain. Swain. But sailors right. are really good at compressing words and making them shorter. And boat swain over a few years, a generation of sailing becomes boatswain. You can't hear me when it's blowing 20 miles an hour and you're 150 feet above the deck. Right. But the pipe will kill. So there's a series of commands, perhaps, then, yeah, or there signals. Are, I know four commands, and there will be over 100 pipe orders. There's a specific order for hauling. There's a specific order for shopping. There's a specific order to pass orders. It's just called pass the word. In case an order is given, it's given to a, a, a nearby bosun's mate, and he will blow. And he will say, pass the word. And he will give an order to every other petty officer in the range of his voice pick up his pipe, blow what I just blew, and pass the word throughout the ship. It's our early PA. Early PA. All right. All right. The, uh, the deck is right. divided into five divisions. The forecastle. Okay. The, the most forward part. part. Mm -hmm. okay. At the bow. The foremost, the main mast, the mizzen mast, and the after guard, which handles the stem of the ship. Each division will have its own individual call. Its own individual call. Okay. Mm -hmm. The rain is starting a little bit harder, so if you can speak up just a little okay. bit more, I want to make sure our viewers can hear us. Well, each division will have its own identifier. Okay. So if a note is, if a series of notes is blown that identifies it as the foremast, only the men working in the foremast division will have to pay attention to that. Word. Could be a lot of whistles going yes, off. Yes, there are. See, so one of the things you're learning as a landsman, the mm -hmm. lowest enlisted rank in the Navy, is the bosun pipe calls. You'll learn it's quick. All right, I will. I. Well, hold on. Folks, welcome. You do have four decks to explore, which means you found ladders going up and down. All right. Any questions? Feel free to ask. Paul, well, it looks like it's going to be a rainy day all day. The rain's getting a little bit worse, and I know you have to get back to attending to the guests that are starting to arrive, but do you have a preference? Do you kind of like the ship when it's sort of quiet and gray like this, or do you like a bright, sunny day, or do you have any, do you have any I like a bright, sunny day. Bright, sunny day, all right. All right, we get more visitors, and the fun of this ship is, is talking, working here is talking to the visitors and telling the story of the ship and the story of the men who live and die. Well, as I mentioned before, I know you have to go. Are there 
typical questions that a visitor asks? What's the most typical? Oh, well, the three most asked questions. How big was the crew? How many men were in the crew? Okay. And our, our standard response is around 300. The official number is 319, but in the peacetime Navy, you never have to go through. Okay. All right. Is she floating? When people ask me that question, I say we get asked that question a lot, but never on a windy day. All right. Okay. The ship displaces 800 tons of water from here in the sheltered area. Mm -hmm. We don't need much. Okay. Except on a windy day or when the tides come in. All right. And then the third most common statement or question is, they must have been short back then. And the answer is yes, of course. What was the average but height? The, the average height of my crew in the Civil War was 5 foot 7. So the Navy has a minimum height of 4 foot 8. And after that, the Navy doesn't care how tall you are. And I will have men who are over 6 foot 8. And as I explained to folks, when you're going up a wall, and you're standing on a piece of rope about this thick, to work and reach and pull the sails in and let them go, the taller you are, the safer you are when you are. The four foot eight is the minimum height height because if a man is not least that tall, he cannot go along with the sail. Right, okay. And that's and when you go below and you see how small short the decks get shorter, I tell them it's to keep the ship in the water and the people can put it on. Okay. To keep the center of gravity on. So those are the three most asked questions. Fascinating. Any uh, I know you have to go out. Paul, as we were sitting here talking, I noticed that right across from us is the John W. Brown. It's a fascinating ship. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about it, kind of its history? I can, and as a matter of fact, under my period garb, I am wearing a John W. Brown t-shirt, Liberty Ship Project. The Don John W. Brown was built here in Baltimore at Tealfield Shipping Yard, and she is one of two surviving Liberty ships from World War II. The other one is on the west coast. President Northfield. The Brown was built here in Baltimore and she served carrying military cargo from the United States to Great Britain and to Europe. And there were over a thousand Liberty ships built in the United States and in Great Britain. There's only two and left. There's only two in the United States left. There may be a few left serving as traders in smaller countries. But um, by and large, they've been replaced because the, the newer ships carry more. I, I seem to remember that during wartime, they were put together. They were built in a fantastically short period of time. Yeah, they for us a patriotic display. Let's say I was going to say stunt, but maybe it wasn't a stunt. They did put a Liberty ship together in seven days. All right. Um, I've heard from historians. That, that Liberty ship didn't seem to be served before it started having the care problem. Okay. All right. The average uh, time for building, I believe the Brown, and I know a man who lived in Baltimore and who worked on the Brown, um, making them. He was much down there. Um, I believe the Brown was put together in something like 30, 35 days in that time. So Paul, the, the Brown, it's it's obviously what, a thousand feet long, maybe or something? No, 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 she's not that long. Eight hundred feet it was um, put together in thirty days. She's about three hundred. She's only about three hundred feet. But still, that's a huge ship. And uh, where where can our viewers see her? I know she's not normally birthed there, but it's somewhere no, in the No, She's been here um, she's here through today. She is normally at Pier Five in Canada. Okay. Uh, she's all on the Canton waterfront. And they do have a website. Right. Um, as I said, my t-shirt is, is Project Liberty Ship. Uh, but you also can find the John W. Brown website. And okay, so that would give us hours and the, the they do. tours. They, they, like they run World War II uh, cruises out, out of Baltimore and other cities. Interesting. So you can tour it quite easily every once in a while. If you get yes. lucky, you could. And obviously, there can be a charge for this crew yes. because it is. It's maintained by volunteers and donations mm -hmm. and a foundation. And so well, they ask. A, they ask for a donation when you when you go to visit the ship. Their World War II day cruises are, of course, one million dollars. And they're, I would assume, wearing World War II garb. Correct. World War II uniforms. Uniforms. Very good. All right. Paul, in the Inner Harbor, there are a number of fascinating vessels. I wonder if you could give our viewers just a quick uh, sort of a 
have a tour of which one of which I can see when I come down here. Yeah. Um, the Constellation is one of four vessels in historic ships in Baltimore. You see. The other three are the submarine course, the light ship Chesapeake. The course and the Chesapeake are right here, three next to the aquarium. Next to the aquarium. We, are, we are here on the Constellation right here at one. And then we have the Coast Guard Cutter Team, which is the last warship afloat that saw the Japanese attack on the Pearl Harbor in December of 1961. And the Taney is over on the Pearl and, and folks that uh, if they can just come down here, they can purchase tour tickets, but they can also get more information on their website? Yes. Um, the website is www.historicships.org. Okay. Or you can just uh, also use our old website, ussconstellation.org, and you can read the records of the historic ships. Okay. Well, Paul, we're going to need to go to break. I want to thank you for coming. It's, it's a fascinating area. We're going to go to break. We'll be right back. 65 saw the end of Constellation's active sea service. From 1871 to 1893, home once again in the Chesapeake Bay, Constellation served as the practice ship for the midshipmen at the United States Naval Academy, where she earned the nickname the Cradle of Admirals. Constellation's cruising grounds stretched from Annapolis northward to Newport, Rhode Island, as the ship provided the future leaders of the United States Navy their summers of sail training at sea. In 1878, Constellation, along with the USS Constitution, sailed to La Havre, France, carrying American exhibits for display at the Paris Exhibition. In 1880, Constellation's guns were removed, her inner compartments reconfigured, and her hold filled with 500 tons of food and clothing destined for the relief of famine in Ireland. She departed from New York on March 30th and arrived in Queenstown, Ireland three weeks later. English and Irish dignitaries, including the Duke of Edinburgh himself, celebrated Constellation's mission of mercy. In 1892, Constellation made her last transatlantic voyage, carrying priceless works of art from Italy and France to America for display at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Constellation took her final cruise the next summer. As her crew of midshipmen disembarked, Constellation's sailing career was at an end. Although the age of sail had passed away, Constellation remained active, and from 1894 to 1933, she served as a stationary training ship at the U.S. Naval Training Center in Newport, Rhode Island. And it was there in Newport that Constellation saw her last official naval service as the relief flagship for the U.S. Navy's Atlantic Fleet and Battleship Squadron 5 during the Second World War. Almost 100 years old, USS Constellation was still serving her country. In 1955, Constellation returned home to the Chesapeake Bay, this time for permanent display in Baltimore. Constellation was kept afloat until 1994 when she was closed to the public. A critical restoration completed in 1999 ensured that the USS Constellation would remain open to visitors. And improvements to the ship continue today. Constellation is, is constantly changing. Uh, if you came on board a year ago, uh, you'll see something new today. If you come on a year from now, uh, you'll see something new then. We are, we're constantly working to improve the ship. Constellation's restoration has helped keep Chesapeake Bay maritime trades and traditions alive. Today, Constellation is the largest example of Chesapeake Bay shipbuilding in existence. That's enough history for now. Paul, it's been great talking with you. I know you enjoy working on the ship. Do you have any personal anecdotes that you'd like to share with our audience? Oh, well, I've got a few. I, let, let me just say that uh, Two of my most memorable days, memorable days working here on the ship. Um, last year, when First Lady and Shuttle Bomber visited the ship with her daughters, um, I was at the gangway and I was at the freighter, and that, that was a big deal for, for us and the rest of the crew. Um, yesterday, I had a descendant of a crew member of the constellation who visited, and his descendant actually died in an accident on the the ship. And whenever I get a chance to talk to descendants or the men who are World War II veterans who actually spent the time on the ship as we served as the flagship of the Atlantic Sea for six months, uh, it 
hear their stories of their personal experience with membership is always a memorable day for me. Because the reason I do work here is to tell the stories of the American community that's all to keep those stories in the story. There will be two great remembrances. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Let's see what happens when you come aboard Constellation. When you come on board, cell phones and everything don't work anymore. This turns into the 1860s and you are back in time on the Constellation learning what it was like to be here. People come on board and they, they get touched by this, by this walking through history that they're able to do. And they're able to, to see the hammocks and see the officer's wardroom and, and sit in the captain's cabin and have this whole immersive experience that you never are going to get at most types of museums. So this is a really wonderful experience for them. And they have no idea what they're, what they're missing out on. And then they come on board and they keep coming back. We fire the cannon, turn the capstan, and ring the bell daily. And we recommend the free self-guided audio tour, which comes in two flavors. One perfect for children, the other for adults. Plus, there's the ever-popular Powder Monkey Tour for kids, and hands-on adult tours like A Ship as a Machine and Black Sailors in Navy Blue. Groups can also come aboard and sling their hammocks in our overnight program or host special events. Our crew knows the USS Constellation is an amazing experience, but don't just take our word for it. Here's what recent visitors had to say. It's very kid-friendly, very family-oriented, and the kids will love it, and they'll come out asking questions, which I love. It transports you back. You can almost get the feel that you were actually there because laying in that hammock, <laughs> like, oh my goodness. I think it's really interesting because it shows you exactly how they slept and how they ate and how they went through life. But it was an excellent, uh, excellent tour and uh, I think it's something they, they need to maintain for uh, generations to come. Should be kind of a must for people who are in the area and have an hour or two to spend. It's just amazing to see how what people lived in, how hard they worked in order to accomplish what they did. It brings your learning alive and that it helps you to understand. Like rather than looking to, at pictures, you can actually see what they were in and you can actually understand it. I think it makes me appreciate being an American, knowing these people went through these things to put me where I am now. I'd say come see it. Yeah, we were a little bit leery because of the age of our children, four and seven but they enjoyed it so much. It really kind of surprised us. We thought it'd be more for us, the parents, but no, they, they loved it. <laughs> they had a good time. Yeah, they had a great time. So come aboard USS Constellation. And while you're here in Baltimore, be sure to visit these other attractions of the Chesapeake Bay Gateways Network. The Baltimore Visitor Center, a good place to start your tour of this historic city and region. The National Aquarium on Pier 3 near the USS Constellation Museum the Lightship Chesapeake, and Seven Foot Knoll Lighthouse, both part of the Baltimore Maritime Museum. The Frederick Douglass Isaac Myers Maritime Park and Museum, headquarters of the Living Classrooms Foundation. Fells Point, an early American shipbuilding center, and the Fells Point Maritime Museum. And of course, Fort McHenry National Monument, where the people of Baltimore valiantly defended the city from the British during the War of 1812, and Baltimore's own Francis Scott Key wrote our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. So welcome aboard USS Constellation and enjoy your visit to the historic sites of the Chesapeake Bay Gateways Network. Well, we're back. I'm Steve Isan. I'm with Paul O'Neill. It's been fascinating to hear about the Constellation and the other ships in beautiful downtown Baltimore, the Inner Harbor. Paul, I want to thank you for coming. Any last words before we let you get back to working with some of the guests here? Well, we're open seven days a week, come rain or shine. Um, we're open from 10 to 5.30. Hours will increase in the summertime. And the special week of June 13th to June 19th, Navy Week, when we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the War of 1812 being declared, the ship will have special hours and will be open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. on those days. 
And one last item, and, I'll, and then I'll let you go. I notice there's a cannon up, up forward there. Do they occasionally fire that cannon? Navy ships do not have cannons. Oh my God! Navy ships. That's twice now. That's Navy twice. Ships. I call. I'm sorry. All right. What are they? What are they Navy called? ships have guns. Guns. All right. Guns. All right. You can. The tell. army has cannons. Right. The Navy has guns. Right. You can fine. tell I'm a land lover here, but uh, all, right. all right. I'm sorry. Go that, ahead. The gun at the bow the that we fire, uh, weather permitting, weather permitting, is a 20 pound carabiner. And um, seven days a week, we begin a breach engagement at quarter of 12. Well, all right. And uh, we fire the gun around 12 o'clock, the ship, and I'm giving the call to the belt to fly back as well. And uh, I've been there. On Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, we do an additional fire rate um, that is scheduled for four, all beginning at four. Okay. okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's a gun, it's not a cannon. Paul, thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm Steve Isant. This is Top of the Morning. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for watching. I'm nuts about downtown Baltimore's west side. Hello, I'm John Waters, and I'm proud to say that Baltimore has always been my home. It's the inspiration behind all my films, including Hairspray, Crybaby, Serial Mom, and A Dirty Shame. Let me tell you, there are not a more eccentric, monumental, eclectic, intriguing, and character-filled 28 blocks anywhere in the world. And I'm here to prove it to you. This is where Babe Ruth was born. They tell me he's the best baseball player ever. Not that I'd know. I'm more into theater. Like nearby arena players, the nation's longest continuously running African-American community theater. I'm also a big fan of century-old Antique Row where New York dealers come to buy and later mark up their purchases sky-high for their Manhattan buyers. On that same block sits the UB Blake National Jazz Institute, housing memorabilia from Baltimore jazz greats like Billie Holiday and, of course, UB himself. The West Side is also where the Maryland Historical Society calls home, with its many Baltimore artifacts, including the original manuscript of the Star Spangled Banner and Nipper, the RCA dog. Oh, and the National Dentistry Museum, the only one of its kind in the U.S., is where George Washington's dentures live. And no, they were never wooden. And right in the middle of it all, as if just to add mystery and intrigue, sits the gravesite of Edgar Allan Poe, my kind of guy. Sometimes I go there to meditate. Now, the thing that defines Baltimore for many people around the world is right here also, our sports franchises, the Orioles and the Ravens, two birds that nest in the West. The Walters Art Museum is also known internationally, featuring an interactive experience exploring 55 centuries of art. A man named Gustav Krug worked at an ironworks foundry on Saratoga Street on the west side way back in 1810, and it's still a working ironworks foundry today. Six-generation Krugs still work here. In Baltimore, we find a good place, we like to stick with it. Now contrast that with one of the world's most advanced operating room facilities just a couple blocks away at the University of Maryland Medical System. Get ill, get fixed, infectious, fashionable, Full of vim and Baltimore vigor, I walk the west side streets these days in amazement at what it's become. I'm nuts about downtown Baltimore's west side. You will be, too.